So a set is a collection of objects. Each object is called an element. Sets are usually denoted by capital letters such as A, B, or C, and elements of a set are denoted by lowercase letters as A, B, C. Uh, the following table summarizes the notation we will be using today. Okay, so the braces will denote a set. So an example of that, the set of values on a six-sided die, you see the braces one, two, three, four, five, six, denoting all the sides on a, on a six-sided die. The next notation says A is an element of A. So this funny looking symbol means element of or belongs to. So A belongs to set A. A is an element of set A. So if we said is four an element of the set one, two, three, four, five, six, we would say yes, because four is inside our set. Okay. And then the funny looking symbol with the line through it means that A is not an element of the set. So we see, for example, is eight on a six sided die. And eight is definitely not on a six sided die. So eight, eight is not an element. The zero or the circle with the line through it is called the empty set. So this is the set of all, so the example would be the set of all values greater than 10 on a six-sided die. Well, that just doesn't exist. It's a six-sided die and the highest number is six. So this would be the empty set. Okay. This notation says the set of all values of X such that P of X is true. So whatever values we choose for X, we'll have to make P of X true. So our example says that for all values of X such that X is on a six-sided die, this is only true if X is the elements one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, and then a complement is the next notation. So this would say, looking at all positive integers less than 10. So if A is one, three, five, seven, nine, then the complement of A is going to be two, four, six, eight. So it's still gonna be all positive integers less than 10. Okay. And then the next one denotes the number of elements in a set, N of A. So if A, if set A, holds the elements one, two, three, four, five, six. This means that there are six elements in set A, therefore N of A equals six. Okay, so these are notations and let's try them out. All right, let me see something like that. Okay. There we go. Okay. So let U be the set of all positive integers less than 10. So U is going to contain the numbers 1 through 9. Let A be all the odd positive integers less than 10. So A is all the pos, odd, uh, odd positive integers less than 10. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. They're all odd. This means that A complement is gonna have integers less than 10, but instead of them being odd, they're going to be even. So A complement is the elements not in set A, and they're going to be even because set A has odd integers. Okay. And then B, even positive integers less than 10. So B is gonna be two, four, six, eight. These are even positive integers less than 10. This means B complement is going to be odd positive integers less than 10. So for B complement, it's just going to be the set A. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. 
Okay. And then C. C is going to be the set of prime numbers less than 10. So C is 2, 3, 5, 7. These are all prime numbers less than 10. And then C complement is going to be all numbers less than 10 that are not prime. So C complement is going to be 1, and there's 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. These are all numbers that are less than 10, but are not prime. Okay. U is called the universal set since it contains all possible elements. So it contains everything. It contains all the integers less than 10. Okay. A Venn diagram is a picture that represents all possible outcomes by sorting the elements into sets. A Venn diagram for set A above, so a Venn diagram for this set, says that A contains the elements 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And everything outside of A is the complement. It's everything not contained in A, which is 2, 4, 6, 8. And out here is the universal set that contains everything in this Venn diagram. So remember, U contains all those numbers. OK, and then a Venn diagram for the number of elements in set A. Well, if you have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, there are five elements in that set. And everything not in that set is four elements. And again, this is still the universal set. OK, the outer rectangle represents the universal set. The elements in A are also contained in that universal set. <laughs> Almost fell over. Yeah. Try to grab my phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Almost fell down and took the whole office with me. The set that contains all elements in either set is called a union. A key word to denote union is or. The set that contains only the elements common to both sets is called an intersection. A key word to denote intersection is and. All right, so this Venn diagram represents or, and this Venn diagram represents and. So the intersection is and, and the union is or. Okay. Notation representing intersection and union. The first one is A union C, saying elements in set A or set C. So our example here says A union C is one, two, three, five, seven, nine. And the number of elements in A union C is six. And there's six elements in there. One, two, three, five, seven, nine, six elements. So the number of elements is six. Okay. And then A intersect C is gonna be elements in both sets A and C. And this is represented here. So the elements in both sets A and C is three, five, seven. And here's the number of elements, three. Okay, so those are the notations. And now let's construct a Venn diagram for sets A and C, listing the elements in their correct locations. Okay, so let's call this set A, let's call this set C, and here, we see that A has the elements 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And C has the elements 2, 3, 5, 7. So we see that both elements share, I mean, both sets share the elements 3, 5, and 7. So for set A, I'm going to put 1 and 9 here. And for set C, I'm going to put 2 there. And then for their intersection, since they both share elements, they share the same elements, I'm going to put 
three, five, seven here. Okay. So this is the Venn diagram representing the sets A and C. They intersect because they share elements. And now the next Venn diagram just wants to list the number of elements. So here is set A, here's set C. So here in A, there are two elements. One and nine are my two elements. In set C, there's one element. And in their intersection, there are three elements. There you go. Which says total, there are six numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Or we could say the number of elements in A intersect C is six. There we go. Oh, sorry, not A intersect C. Uh, oh, better get that right. A union C is six. But if I said N, the number of elements in A intersect C, which just wants the intersection, would be three. Okay, perfect. Let's do it again. So construct a Venn diagram for sets A and B, listing the elements in their correct locations. A is the set one, three, five, seven, nine, and B is the set two, four, six, eight. Okay. So we see that first off, A and B have no elements in common. A is one, three, five, seven, nine, and B is two, four, six, eight. They have nothing in common, which means that they will not intersect. So here's A and here's B. And putting their elements in, this is gonna be one, three, five, seven, nine, and then two, four, six, eight. Okay, so down here, it says A union B. So once all the elements together, A union B is gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then A intersect B, well, since these two don't intersect because they have no elements in common, since it doesn't exist, we get the empty set. Or you could put empty braces. So since they don't intersect, it doesn't exist, nothing happens, it's the empty set. Never put the empty set inside an empty set. The universe will explode. Don't do it. Okay. Now in the next one, we just want to do the number of elements. So just like above, here's set A, here is set B, and the number of elements in set A are one, three, five, seven, nine. So there's five elements there, and there's four elements here. So down below, it just wants the number of elements in the whole union of both sets. So together there are nine elements. And then the intersection, since they don't intersect and we're listing the number of elements, there are zero elements in their intersection. Okay. Note the differences in the Venn diagrams for A and C and A and B. The sets A and B have no intersection, so they are said to be disjoint, which means their sets are not joined at any part. All right, excellent. Good so far? Yes, sir. So, definitely something new, right? <laughs> 
no no algebra involved that's that's all right with me <laughs> all right so next referring to the venn diagram above find the indicated number of elements all right what did i do there there we go okay so number one says what are the number of elements in the whole set everything here so that's going to be 17 plus 52 plus 9 plus 22 which is going to be 100 elements okay and then two says what are the number of elements in set a well, the number of elements in set a you have to just look at set a there 17 plus 52, there are 69 elements in set A. And then set B, 52 plus 9, 61 elements. And then the number of elements in A intersect B, right there where they intersect. There are 52. And then the number of elements in A union B. So we want the total number of elements together. So 17 plus 52 plus 9. That's going to be 78. All right. And then the number of elements in B complement meaning the number of elements that are not in B. So you have to look at set B, and instead of counting the elements inside of it, you are counting the elements outside of set B. So that's going to be 17 and 22, which is 39. And then the number of elements not in set A the complement of A. So look at A and count the elements outside of it. 9 and 22. 31. Okay. So that's reading a Venn diagram and putting all those elements in order. Okay. Next is reading a contingency table. All right. So the table below represents the number of students enrolled in my business courses in summer 2015. Oh man, I need to update that. All right. So reading the contingency table, we want to determine each of the following. So all of these just want the number of elements. Okay. So number one says the number of elements in the first algebra class. So if you look at the rows, that's the everything here represents the first class and S represents everything in the second class. So for the number of elements in the first algebra class, it's going to be 14. And then the number of elements in the second class is 18. Okay. And then oh, I'm going out of order. All good. So we'll go to two and four. Two says the number of males, 18. And four says the number of females, 14. Okay. Four. The number of students in the first class unioned with the set of females. So you can say the number of students in the business class or the number of females. So we want the total number of students in business with the total number of females. So there is something we have to be careful on here. So when we get the total number of students in the first class, we get 14. 
plus the total number of females, which is 14. But we have now counted a number twice. And what number is that going to be? That's the number of females. So we can't count that twice. So we count it once in the total number of students in the first class, and then we count it again in the total number of, stu of females. So we can't double count it, so we must subtract that four. So the number of students in the first class union with the set of females is just going to be 24. Okay. And then five says the number of students in the second class intersected with the number of males. So you get the number of students in the second class intersected with the number of males. Basically, we're saying, what do they have in common? And what they have in common is that there are eight males, because that is the I, those are the elements that they both share together. Okay. Six, the number of students in the first class union with the number of students in the second class. So this just wants the total number of students, and that's going to be 32. Okay. Seven. The number of students in the second class intersected with the number of females. So the students in the second class intersected with the number of females. We see that they both share that element of 10. Okay. And then eight. The number of students in the first class intersected with the number of students in the second class. Okay, well, we see that the number of students in the first class and the number of students in the second class, they don't intersect and they shouldn't. They both have different elements. Therefore, they have nothing in common. Well, one is because different students go to the first class and another group of different students go to the second class. Therefore, this will be the empty set. And then nine, the number of males intersected with the number of females. So the set of males intersected with the set of females, totally two different sets, nothing in common. So once again, the empty set. Okay, and then 10, the number of students in the first class intersected with the number of males. So here we go. There's the number of students in the first class intersected with the number of males. We see that they share the element of 10. <clears throat> And 11, the number of students in the second class union, union, union <laughs> with the number of females. So the number of students in the second class is 18, plus the number of females, which is 14, but we again have counted a number twice. We have counted 10 twice. So we have to subtract that 10 and we're going to get 22. All right. And that's how you read the contingency table. All good with that page? 
Yeah, nice, nice and simple. <laughs> All right. Well, that was 7.2. Yeehaw. Now on to 7.3. All right. So it says, recall from the last set of notes, we had the universal set, which contains the elements one through nine. A was odd positive integers less than 10. And a complement was everything less than 10. That wasn't odd. Two, four, six, eight. B was the even positive integers less than 10. And B complement it's going to be everything else that's less than 10 that isn't even. So once again, that's going to be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. All right. And then C is prime numbers less than 10. So it's 2, 3, 5, 7. And then C complement is going to be everything else that's not prime. 1, 4, 6, 8, 9. Okay. And now construct a Venn diagram for sets A and C, listing the number of elements. Okay, so we're using sets A and C above. So this just says list the number of elements. Okay, so this is going to be A, this will be C, and in set A, there are five elements, and in set C, there are four. But once again, we see that they share three elements, three, five, seven. So in set A, this means that there's going to be two elements here, three elements in their intersection, and for C, one element. And remember, all of this is in the universal set. Okay, so the next thing says the number of elements in A union C, so the number of elements together in sets A and C. So that's going to be six. The number of elements in their intersection is three. The number of elements in A is five, and the number of elements in C is four. Okay. And now we say construct a Venn diagram for sets A and B, listing the number of elements. So once again, there's A. Uh, well, hang on, let me not draw these yet. Let's look at the sets first. And then here's B, two, four, six, eight. So looking at both sets, we see they have no elements in common. So for set A, it has five elements. And for set B, it has four elements in our universal set. OK. So now, down below, listing the number of elements, it says the number of elements in A union B. So A plus B, we get nine elements. And then the number of elements in the intersection of A and B, they don't intersect, so we get 0. And then the number of elements in A is five, and the number of elements in B is four. OK. All right. So now, OK, good. Uh, zoom right there. We'll start with the left side. It says, does the number of elements in A union C equal the number of elements in A plus C. So A union C from above was six, and the number of elements in A is five, and the number of elements in C is four. And these definitely don't equal because six does not equal nine. Okay, and then let's look at the right side. Does the number of elements in A union B equal the number of elements in A plus B. So here, the number of elements is 9, and in A is 5, and B is 4. So 9 is 9. OK. 
crazy, right? So the reason being for this is because, well, A and C intersect. A and B do not intersect. So for A and C, if you have the number of elements, this means, remember, from the contingency table, we're double counting something. So we can't double count elements. This is why when your, sex, when your sets intersect, A union C is not the same as A plus C. But if your sets are disjoint, since they don't intersect like the another Venn diagram, this means that A union B is equal to A plus B only because they are disjoint. Okay. But now, does A union C equal A plus C minus the intersection? So the number of elements in A union C is six, A is five, four, and then minus the intersection, which is three. And here you'll get six equal to nine minus three, which is six, and that works out. So we have to subtract the three elements because we double count them. We cannot double count them. Okay. And then does A union B equal A plus B minus the intersection of A and B? So nine equals five plus four minus zero, and nine equals nine. Yes, and again, this only works because they are disjoint. Okay. Cool. So the addition principle for counting, for any two sets A and B, the number of elements in A union B equal elements in A plus elements in B minus the intersection of A and B. This is if they intersect. If they don't intersect, if A and B are disjoint, then the number of elements in A intersect B is zero. Therefore, if A and B are disjoint, then A union B is the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B. Okay, so we proved above the addition principle for counting. All right, example one. A class of 30 music students includes 13 who play the piano, 16 who play the guitar, and five who play both the piano and the guitar. How many students in the class play neither instrument? All right. So here it's be easier if we make a Venn diagram. Ooh, look at that. Yeah. And we're going to have two sets. It's going to be piano, guitar, and people who play both the piano and the guitar. OK, so since people play both, we know our sets are going to intersect. So here's piano, and then here's our guitar. OK, so we have. 13 who play the piano and 16 who play the guitar. But then we have five who play both the piano and the guitar. So what I'm gonna do first is fill in the amount of who both plays piano and guitar, which is five. And now reading the sentence again, we have 13 who play piano, meaning that my set P I'm gonna have an eight in there. Because eight plus five, if you just focused on P now, you would get 13. Which means for set G, we have 16 who play the guitar. Well, there's five there already. This means that 11 just play the guitar. So if you look at set G, 11 plus five, we have our 16 who play the guitar. Okay. Now add it up. That's eight plus five plus 11. That is, so I can say, let's do this. P union G, 13 plus 11, that's 24 students who play instruments all together. 
And if there's 30 kids in the music class, it says how many don't play an instrument. And that's going to be six out here somewhere. And this is the universal set. All right. Okay, next. The general social survey polled 1,280 men and 1,530 women to determine their level of education. The results are presented at the table below and we don't have to round anything. Okay, so here's reading another contingency table. How many females earned a high school diploma? So we want to know how many females earned a high school diploma. So that means the amount of females who only earned a high school diploma. So that's going to be the intersection. So females intersect the high school diploma, and we see that number is 827. Okay. And then B, how many in the survey are female or earned a bachelor's degree? And that keyword here is or. So how many are female or earned a bachelor's degree? So that is union bachelor's degree. So this is the double counting. We have the number of females, which is 1531, plus the number of females who earn, or the total number of people who have earned a bachelor's degree, which is 507. But we see that we double counted 259 twice. So we minus 259, and we'll get that the number is 1,779. These are the amount, this is how many in the survey are female or have earned a bachelor's degree. Okay. C, how many females earned a college degree? So the set of females intersect a college degree. Actually, a college degree is going to be considered all those. So actually, no set notation. I guess you could. You'd be sharing it with a couple of sets because you would have the number of females and then college degrees and associates, a bachelor's and a graduate. So it would share all of these elements. Oops. So 128 plus 259 plus 131. And we'd get 518. So 518 females have earned a college degree. Okay, and then D, how many in the survey are male? So how many in the survey are male or earned an associate's degree? There's that key word, or. So this is gonna be males, union, associate's degree. So the number of males is 1280 plus the number of people who've earned an associate's degree is 24. But once again, we've double counted 96. So I have to say minus 96, and I should get 1,408 people. Okay. Cool. All good with this page? 
Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Next is about possible orderings and the multiplication principle. So this example says a couple plans to have three children. How many possible orderings by gender are there for three children? One method is to list all the possible orderings like we have here. So if the first one's a boy, the next one could be a boy and the third one could be a boy or boy, boy, girl, or boy, girl, boy, or boy, girl, girl. So right now, there's four possible orderings. And then what if the first one's a girl? Then it could be girl, boy, boy, girl, boy, girl, 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 boy, or girl, girl, girl. So now there are eight possible orderings for the possibilities of these three children. Okay, so it says, what if a couple wants to have eight children? How would you list, make this tree? That'd be a very, very large tree, right? And is there an easier way? Of course, there's always an easier way. We know that for the first child, there's two choices. For the second child, there's two choices. And for the third child, there's two choices. So if we multiply two times two times two, we get eight. And if you want the eight children, you'd multiply two times two times two times two until you get to two to the eighth to get your possible orderings. Okay. So that brings us to the multiplication principle for counting. If two operations, O1 and O2, are performed in order with N1 possible outcomes for the first operation and N2 possible outcomes for the second operation, then there are N1 times N2 possible combined outcomes of the first operation followed by the second. This can be extended for several N operations. So such as N1 times N2 times N to the N or N sub N. So the multiplication principle for counting says that however many possible outcomes you have for the first one, you'll multiply the possible outcomes for the second one, third one, on and on to you to that final outcome. Okay, so like the above, this says how many possible orderings are there for a couple wanting eight children? Well, two for the first, two for the second, two for the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. So here is eight possible, uh, sorry, these are, yeah, eight possible outcomes. So this is for eight children. And you'll get two times two times two or two to the eighth, which is 256 possible outcomes for your, what is it? For the ordering of your children. Boy, 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 boy boy, girl, boy, 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 all those 256 outcomes. Crazy, right? Don't have eight children. <laughs> Unless you want to. Okay. So let's go ahead and try the multiplication principle. Example three says, a delicatessen serves meat sandwiches with the following options three kinds of bread, five kinds of meat, and lettuce or sprouts. How many different sandwiches are possible, assuming that one item is used from each category? Okay, so we go to this sandwich shop and we have three kinds of bread, five kinds of meat, and two types of greens. So this sandwich shop, it's no Subway, but it does offer 30 possible sandwiches at its store, which is I'm okay with because Subway offers what? 5 million choices for sandwiches? That's too many choices. Those poor Subway workers. 
Okay. Example four. A phone number, or excuse, phone numbers without area codes are seven digits. The first digit cannot be zero or one. The last six digits can be any number from zero through nine. Based only on these requirements, how many phone numbers are possible with an area code? Okay. So we're only allowed the numbers zero through nine. That's 10 digits we can use. Zero through nine is 10 digits. But the first digit of the phone number cannot be zero or one. So that means for the very first digit, we are given eight choices. And then for the remaining six digits, we can use any number we want. 10 choices, 10 choices, 10 choices, 10, 10, 10. So that's for the six numbers. Okay, sum it up and you get eight times 10 to the sixth. And this means for your phone number, we have 8 million choices to choose a phone number. Okay, so 8 million choices. So we should always have new phone numbers, but I guess not anymore. All right. Five, in the year 2009, Textures introduced a new license plate that used the pattern letter, letter, number, letter, number, number, number. Before exclusions, how many possible orderings are available in this format? Okay, so for letters, we know there's 26 letters in the alphabet. And then that's letter, letter. So 26 choices again. And then number, well, it's gonna be like the phone number above. We can only use zero through nine on a license plate. So we're gonna get 10 choices. And then letter again, 26, number, 10, number, number, 10, 10. Clean this up nice. That's 26 to the third times 10 to the fourth. And calculating that, we get 175,760,000 possible choices to make a license plate. So make a cool one. All right. All right, number six. A small combination lock has three wheels, each labeled with the digits, 10 digits from zero to nine. A, how many three digit combinations are possible if digits can be repeated? So this means I get 10 choices for the first digit, 10 choices for the second, and 10 choices for the third. So I get 1,000 possible choices for my combo if I can use the same number, one, one, one. Okay. B, how many three-digit combinations are possible if no digits are repeated? So this means that you have 10 choices for the first one, I can't repeat that number, so we lose a number, which means we have nine choices for the second number. And now I can't repeat any of those two numbers. So this means I have eight choices for the third. And we get 720 possible choices if no digit is repeated. And then last. How many three-digit combinations are possible if successive digits must be different? So this means that after I choose the first number, the next digit must be different than the first. 
So we have 10 choices for the first, but now this digit must be different than the first. So we have nine choices for the second. But then the third number, it must be different from the second, but it could be the same as the first. So we again have nine choices. And that's going to give me 810 possibilities to make my combination. Okay. And that's the counting principle. Everybody good with that? Yes, sir. All right. Yeehaw. And guess what? That was 7.4. Woo! Okay. Take a small breather. <laughs> I can set up because we're going to need Desmos. Hide that, hide that. I just need the regular old calculator. Uh -huh. Okay, so 7.4. This is all about permutations and combinations. So let's learn about factorials. So look for the factorial button on your calculator. Uh, if you have a TI calculator, you'll probably have it under probability menu, or you can just look in your catalog or on the actual computer for an exclamation mark. Um, but again, I'll be using Desmos, and let's try and calculate these factorials. So the first one we have is 5 factorial. So over here, I have 5 factorial, which gives me 120. And then the next, I have, uh, that's annoying, pop-up keyboard, zero factorial, which is one. And then next, I have 30 factorial, oh boy, which is 2.65 times 10 to the 32. And then we have 75 factorial, which it will probably break your calculator. It's going to say uh, number too large. I wonder if it'll break Desmos. Let's see. 75 factorial. Oh, it didn't. Nice. I actually get a value this time, which is 2.48 times 10 to the 109. That's a huge number. Okay, so these are factorials and what do they mean? So a factorial is a collection of n different items that can be arranged in order in factorial different ways. This factorial rule reflects the fact that the first item may be selected in n different ways. The second item may be selected in n minus one ways and so on. Kind of like the combination lock we just did. We had 10 choices for the first one, nine choices for the second, eight choices for the third. Okay, so the notation for factorial, there is just a definition of it here. n factorial can be expanded to n times n minus one, times n minus two, times n minus three, until you get to the very last digit of one. Okay. So if we were to actually expand that, 
like let's look at let's just say five factorial by the rule that would be five times five minus four times five minus three times five minus two and so on and so on so on and so forth so that's how your factorial would work not four why did i put four i was really doing the math in my head sorry five minus one five minus two five minus three on and on and on okay so lucky for us our calculator makes that process a lot faster so what we're going to do here is just type in one factorial all the way to 10 factorial and i know that one factorial is one two factorial is two three factorial is going to be six and then four factorial is i believe 24. we did five factorial already which is 120. and then i'm just going to use my calculator here so my keyboard can stop popping up annoyingly let's see Six, seven, eight. So I get seven twenty, fifty forty, forty thousand three hundred twenty, three hundred and sixty two thousand eight hundred eighty, and three million. No, thirty. Yeah, three million. 628,800, there we go. Okay. So we have that factorial table completed. And then example one says, I will randomly se select students one at a time without replacement until all students have been selected. How many possible orderings are there if I have three students? Okay, so. Since there's no replacement, we just do three factorial. And from the table above, three factorial is six. So we have six possible orderings to randomly select three students. Okay. How many possible orderings if I have five students? Well, that'll be five factorial, which means we have 100 and possible, 120 possible orderings. And then if we have 24 students, ooh, that's going to be a big number. We're going to have, let's see, 24 factorial, oof, 6.20 times 10 to the 23 possible orderings to select students one at a time. Ooh wee. Okay, all good on this page? Yes, sir. All right. So next is just explaining how factorials are used. Factorials are used to find the number of ways all items in a population can be ordered when selected one at a time. For example, if you have five items numbered one through five, you can select them in the following ways. So this whole table represents how to select five items, uh, select five items in the following ways. There you go. So, and if you listed them all out and took forever, well, if you use the factorial, you would see that you would have 120 ways to order the items numbered one through five. So factorial just sums up that process for you, which is great. <laughs> All right. So again, it's, the, it's used to find the number of ways all items in a population can be ordered. Okay. All right. 
Next is something called permutations and combinations. Permutations are used to find the number of ways a sample of items in a population can be ordered when selected at a time. For example, if you have five items numbered one through five, you can select three items in the following ways. So here's the table that represents how to select three items from five items in the following ways. And if you computed this whole table, you would see that there are 60 ways to choose three items from five items. Okay, but we, of course, we have a formula that sums it up. This is the formula for permutations, NPR. You will definitely find that on your calculator in the probability section. So what we say is that we have five items and we're going to permutate them three ways. And if you type this in your calculator, of course, you'll get 60 right away. But with the formula, it's going to give you 5 factorial over 5 minus 3 factorial, which gives you 5 factorial over 2 factorial, which will give you 60. So permutations are all about order. It has to be in order, which brings us up to the next one combinations. Combinations don't care. They're chaotic. They don't care about order. So combinations are used to find the number of ways a sample of items in a population can be selected one at a time, ignoring the order. Thus, each column in the table above represents, uh, above contains repeated drawings. If you have five items numbered one through five, you can select three items as in the table above. Since the order of the selections does not matter, we can collapse the table into 10 choices. So permutations was order. We had to start at one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five. Combinations like we don't care about order, just select three items from the five one way, no order needed. Don't have to go in numerical order. And when we do it that way, we get 10 choices. And the formula for combinations is NCR, which is going to be N factorial over N minus R factorial times R factorial. So what we say here is, oops, is five items to combine three ways. Okay. Or we could say five. I like to say two. It's not proper, but it's fun to say. For permutations, five pick three. Combinations, five, choose three. It's not proper, but it stays in your head. Okay. So on our calculator, let's just go ahead and practice typing in the permutations and combinations. So Desmos has it. It's wonderful. You see in the bottom left corner here, here's, it's annoying, NPR, and it's going to be, I assume it wants a comma, five comma three, and we get 60. And then let's do it again. I do 12, 12 permutate eight or 12 pick eight. There's 12, no. That's annoying. 12 pick eight. And we have, what is that? 19,958,400. Okay. And next is combination. So here we go. Five, choose three, and we get 10. That's what we did above. And then 12, choose eight. And we get 495. So we see the difference. This was from the examples above. 
if we go in order, there's 60 ways to pick things. If we do, don't care about order, there's only 10 ways to pick things. Same with this example. I have 12 items that I want to permutate eight ways, and it has to be in order. So there's 19 million ways to do this. Or I have 12 items and I want to choose them. I want to combine them eight ways, no order. There's only 495 ways to do this. Does not matter. Okay. So what is the main difference between permutations and combinations? Order. Permutations need order. Combinations ignore order. Okay. So let's go ahead and try out these examples. And when working these, we want to know, does order matter? All right. So example three. In a long distance foot race, let me zoom in a bit. In a long distance foot race, how many different finishes among the first five places are possible if 50 are running? So if you're doing a race, does order matter? Do you come in first place or does anybody come in first place? Does the last person come in first place? And we would say no, right? This has to deal with order. There's only one first place, there's only one second place, and there's only one last place. So there has to be order in a race. So this means that we have 50 people running, but we can only pick five winners. So 50 permutate five. Let's see what we got. And there are, ooh, is that 25? No, 254 million, 251,200 ways to get among the first five places. A, those are pretty good chances when you're running with 50 people. <laughs> All right, so that was a permutation. Okay. Example four, to win the jackpot in the Texas lottery, a player must match all five numbers drawn, drawn from a field of 37. How many possible outcomes are there? So here, order does not matter. The balls don't fall in order, right? When they drop, it's a random number from, what is it, like one to 37? So it could be a five that drops. The next could be a two that drops. The next could be a three that drops. So there's no order in which the balls fall. So here is a combination. So this means that a player must match all five numbers drawn from a field of 37. So we have 37 numbers and we only get to choose five. So let's see what your chances are at winning the lottery or just the cash five, 37 pick five. You have 435,897 ways to win the cash five. Okay. Example five. To win the jackpot in the Texas two-step, a player must match four numbers drawn from a field of 35 and match one number from a field of 35. How many possible outcomes are there? So again, this is the lottery. There's no order. The winning numbers fall in any order. And so this is going to be another combination. So we have to match four numbers from a field of 35. So 35, choose four, times, and we have to match one number from a field of 35. 35 numbers, choose one. Okay, let's see. NCR, 
35 choose 4 times let's see r 35 choose 1 and you have 1 million 832,600 possible ways to win the Texas two-step with that multiplier number. So you're saying there's a chance, right? Okay. Example six. Three departments have 12, 15, and 18 members, respectively. If each department selects a delegate and an alternate to represent the department at a conference, how many ways can this be done? All right. So we are selecting a delegate and an alternate. So it has to be an order. It's a delegate. It's an alternate. We are picking an order. There is no chaos here. Everything has to be in order. So for this one, we have 12 people in the first department, and we need to choose a delegate and an alternate. So this means that this will be 12 pick two people. Times in the second department, there's 15, and we also want to pick two. And then in the third department, there's 18, and we also want to pick two. So there's order to this one. So let's see. NPR 12 pick two. NPR 15 pick two. And NPR 18 pick two. We have 8,482,320 ways to pick a delegate and an alternate. Okay. Last one. An electronic store receives a shipment of 30 graphing calculators, including six that are defective. Four of these calculators are sent to a high school. How many selections can be made? All right. So we are shipping these calculators to the high schools. There's uh, no order in which these calculators are going out. So this is going to be a combination. OK. So it says, including, so a, they receive a shipment of 30 graphic calculators, including six that are defective and four of these calculators are sent to a high school. So there are four of these sent to the high school. So this means that we have 30 calculators and we are going to choose four to send to the high school. So there's no order in the way we're picking these calculators. So I guess that's better to say. There's no order in picking these calculators. We have 30 and we're choosing four to send out. So we have 30 choose four. And we have 27,405 ways to choose these four calculators to send out. All right, and then B, how many of these selections will contain no defective calculators? Well, if six calculators are defective and there's a total number of 30 calculators, this means that there are 24 calculators that are not defective. And we still wanna send four of those out. So, 24 choose four, and we have 10,626 ways to select the 24 calculators, four of the 24 calculators that are not defective.
And woohoo, guys. That was the very last lecture. We are done.